very much for joining me today. My name is Thuy. I'm the founder and general uh, manager of TechSpeed, the network for people who are working in tech industry and tech-driven businesses. Uh, I'm very honored to host you all here, our great speakers who come from different corners of the world and different time zone as well, but you still managed to be here. So I myself and TechBiz community really appreciate that. So to let our audience know more about you, could you please introduce yourself? I'm Sven. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I used to work at, at PlayStation. I'm an ex-video uh, game dev studio owner and now uh, co-owner of Drupal's AR. We're an augmented reality content network. Um, we believe that augmented reality is the layer that will make the metaverse visible and usable by traditional markets. So uh, physical retail, life sports, travel and hospitality, those now, they don't have the same tools and that a lot of digital markets have. We bring those same tools to them, uh, also allow them uh, the freedom to own their data, as well as the end user, the freedom to own their data. So maybe, uh... Evelyn, could you please be the next to introduce? Absolutely. Evelyn Mora here, CEO and founder of uh, Digital Village. Um, Digital Village is a first sustainability-focused MMO metaverse built on Unreal Engine with its own marketplace. Um, yeah, really looking forward to the conversation today. Uh, Eddie, could you be the next? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Eddie Travia. I am the uh, CEO and co-founder of Coincilium, uh, first blockchain company to IPO in London. Uh, we have been investing in more than uh, 20 companies. I'm also the director of uh, IOV Labs in Asia Pacific. IOV Labs develops uh, uh, RSK smart contract network, most popular implementations. And uh, in the NFT space, we have invested in a company that is uh, doing our patronage on Polygon is called Minty.art. We also have our own NFT development studio called Nifty Labs. Uh, we're building a marketplace on RSK for uh, an NFT marketplace for Nifty Labs. And we also have invested in a company that is doing an NFT collection of 3D avatars called uh, Blockbots and coming up with a, a play to earn game. Uh, Chris, could you be the next to introduce? Uh, yes, I think my, my background is a little bit similar to Addy. Um, so I work for, uh, used to work for a uh, blockchain product development house. And uh, recently I uh, co-found uh, a project called Farm Central, which is more like uh, entertainment metaverse, where it's allowing our uh, investor to invest in their favorite movies or even actor, actress. Um, so we help, uh, you know, project as well as uh, KOL or celebrity to issue their social token as well. Um, so we're heading into that uh, entertainment metaverse. Um, uh, on the site, I'm also uh, advising a number of uh, GameFi uh, project uh, recently, uh, and a few uh, of them actually are very focused on uh, AR uh, area, which uh, Span is, is focusing on to really emphasize on the experience of the gaming user. Um, and another uh, game which I'm advising, which is Green Belly, which is a CSR uh, game five project, which they uh, take uh, 30% of you know their revenue to uh, blend uh, more trees uh, all over the place. And we have uh, recently have a few projects in Brazil uh, to do that. Uh, at the same time, I'm also uh, co-founder of a, a venture called Lucky Ventures, where we invest in a number of projects as well. So if you have uh, any cool project, please hit me up on, on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm happy to connect as well. Very happy to uh, know that. Uh, could you please be the next, uh, Gillian? Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for your patience in, in getting me here. I seem to get all the times wrong. Um, my name is Gillian Gotzel. I'm based in Ireland. Um, until lockdown, I met many people. Eddie, I think I met you in Mac Macau, I think, wasn't it? Or something like that it was crazy. Yes. I know Bridget very well, of yes. course. Correct. Um, so a, a lot of traveling. Uh, started up again, Web Summit, DeFi Live last week. But I'm a journalist and broadcaster and author in the space. And I guess things that, I, that may be relevant to this audience is that um, uh, Reece, I write, write, for, write for Cointelegraph and Coindesk, but I also write on my own site, uh, blockleaders.io. And um, I recently, recently got a bit of a, a push. And so I, mean, I feature all the stories. So guys come and talk to me afterwards. I, I love talking about anything to do with blockchain in the space. 
but um, I signed a contract during the summer with Brock Pierce's roundtable. So I'm going to join that, that roundtable sensor resistant platform. And then last week, week four in Web Summit, Tim, Tim Draper agreed to become an advisor to me. So I'm getting very excited. Things are starting to move, which is very exciting. And I'm also working with uh, Ad Lunum with uh, Jason Fernandez. You might know him. Um, and it's a new launch pad, which aims to benefit all the players, not just the big KOL. So, and, and there's loads. I'm doing an NFT drop myself next month of a book that I, I, I wrote last year. And I sketched all the, the participants. And um, my art teacher during lockdown said my art skills they kind of range from between uh, Quentin Blake, you know, the very famous illustrator of the Roald Dahl books, and a five-year-old. I think I'm more like the five-year-old, so I'm very sorry for people I've sketched. But anyway, I'm going to do a drop with those uh, on the Wax platform um, uh, early next month. So very excited to be in the space. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, please, Bridget, could you be the next? Of course. I'm Bridget Greenberg. I am the founder of The Bigger Pie. So The Bigger Pie is an organisation that we started in September 2019 to make sure that we can build gender equity in the blockchain space. So we have a global community of women and gender minority leaders and learners in, in the space across the globe, across all different sections. And we make sure that we can do everything possible to sort of move the needle so that we have visibility of women in the space, working with event organisers, that we can connect women uh, more easily to each other for education when it comes to cons um, consultancy work uh, opportunities you know the full range um, and as part of that and or out of that should I say I'm also co-founder of the 200 billion club where we're actually supporting all female founders to get investment which is a huge uh, issue at the moment very nice uh, thank you very much for the short but very informative interruptions uh, after listening to you, then I feel like I'm a hybrid, not just because I connect you together, but also because I'm interested in both fields, uh, blockchain and metaverse. Uh, I would like to say a little bit about the topic of today, blockchain meets metaverse. It's not just about the content that we are going to talk about today, but it's also about the people who are joining me today as a webinar. They are outstanding, excellent representatives from blockchain and metaverse communities. Um, and they gather here for the first time to talk about a very interesting topic that connect two of the most talk about and hottest fields of today. We are very proud to organize this event, uh, to connect people together. And TechSpace now is also being built into a platform uh, where you can read news insightful articles and watch video shows about technology, business, investments, and related fields. So after this uh, webinar, uh, feel free to reach out if you would like to uh, read news or read articles or watch our shows, or even to connect to uh, advisors, investors, and business leaders who can be the mentors in your field. We are happy to help. And um, let's get back to the topic of today. Um, First of all, I would like to ask uh, our speaker who come from the blockchain community. Um, this question may be a little bit basic and you may have heard a lot before, but uh, for a lot of people who are watching us today, they come from different backgrounds, so I guess it's still useful. What do you think are the, the main uh, benefits of blockchain technologies and what make it become an important part of our lives in the future? or even can change the world. Maybe, Adi, could you please? Sure. So I think it's a great to always remind people the benefits of blockchain. Uh, of course, I do it regularly, probably like my uh, fellow panelists here who are, who are in the space. Um, so what you have to remember that blockchain is the first trust-minimized technology, and it enforces digital scarcity. And by doing so, it contributes to the creation of what we call uh, the Internet of Value. So because on the blockchain, all the transactions are timestamped and recorded in a way that no one can tamper with the data, it brings this account accountability and transparency and what we call near instant finality to the transaction. Mm -hmm. uh, all this without the friction from uh, a central authority. Uh, and we all know that trust is a prerequisite for commerce. So in that sense, in, our, in this digital world where we live in, you know, everything is based on software. We need this trust. And so trust minimized solutions like blockchain are, are, are really great for that. And it's actually these principles that actually have led to the emergence of the whole you know, blockchain industry. So we have smart contracts, for example, and they rely on code and they don't rely on central trusted uh, third parties to approve transactions. 
And this has helped really a multitude of blockchain projects to, to, to directly interact with the users. So several projects and applications um, have reached, you know, huge market capitalizations. We're talking about, you know, millions and billions of dollars. And a lot of, and most of those have achieved this by being in direct contact with the users, you know, direct interaction. Um, so you have developers who are interested in these protocols and develop usually on open source um, technologies and open source tools. Mm -hmm. So I would say the main benefit for, of blockchain is this uh, direct economic relationship with the users. And it allows this uh, large ecosystem to grow at scale without any intermediaries and based on new decentralized uh, governance models. Mm -hmm. uh, would you like to add something, Julian? Yeah, I was going to say I I, I like that I use it, the the three Ds. That's why I love blockchain, and I, I more than like I love it. It democratizes things, access to finance, to education. It's just such a powerful transform transformational technology, which is what got me in the first place. It wasn't, you know, to the moon or FOMO or anything. It was just the fact that it, it just democratized. And after the the two thousand and eight crash, um, now I didn't know about blockchain. I didn't know about Bitcoin then. It took me, I was a bit late, it took me until 2017, I think, before I discovered it. But I went, whoa, this makes sense. It's disruptive. I love that. Again, going back to the um, 2008 crash, I think the scales fell from a lot of people's eyes going, there's something the matter with this world. We need to fix it. And how do you fix things? You disrupt them. You know, I'm not an anarchist or anything like that, but you take clever thinking and you apply it to old ways of doing things and say, why? Why? You know, and, and that whole disruptive thinking is very attractive to me because it, even like with, with the climate, uh, climate change, I see that as an opportunity for us to do things differently rather than it, slap on taxes, whatever. And, and obviously it's very urgent, it's very necessary, but view it in the prism of um, opportunity. It makes it a much more attractive thing to handle. So disruptive. And finally, um, and Eddie mentioned it too as well, decentralized. And we know with lockdown, all of us who were not in essential jobs, uh, stayed at home, worked from home. And I, that was a huge, I think, I mean, I think in, in the crypto world, the Web3 world, we all know we can work remotely. But for the rest of the world, it was a big, oh, we can actually do things differently. And I think like I live in Ireland and um, I don't commute to work. But there are so many people who waste so many hours going up and down to Dublin to an office, you know, three hours a day in a commute when they could be spending that time with their family, planting trees or whatever they want to do, going out partying. Um, and I know it's, it's just that, that decentralized approach to life it's just it's an amazing and, and again it gets rid of monopolies there's a whole rake of things so those are my three things a democratization disruption and decentralized those are the three main benefits for me for blockchain mm, that's great uh would you like to add anything chris i think both uh julian and uh eddie already share almost um every single point why we're supporting blockchain uh but i think coming from uh someone living and working around more like emerging economies and like, you know, in, in a sense, you know, slightly uh, more de uh, developing and poorer country like Southeast Asia, um, blockchain make perfect sense for a lot of the uh, infrastructure and product out there uh, where, you know, like um, if you, for example, if you're using some uh, certain uh, bank services, in Vietnam or Indonesia, if you try to send money from one bank to another bank during the weekend, sorry, it doesn't work. Uh, we just stop you there. We wait until people coming back uh, to the bank on Monday uh, to process all of that. So blockchain application actually have a chance to, again, democratize uh, all of that, decentralize all of that, uh, you know, like uh, removing the middle layer, the processor, the approval, uh, everything in the middle and just speed up everything. Um, and again, uh, it's uh, it's doing that with uh, keeping all the transparencies and efficiency together with it, right? So it's made perfect sense for a lot of the country uh, out there. Uh, so you would be no surprise that um, that's why Vietnam is, you know, like uh, the number one uh, bullish country uh, regarding crypto. And I think they're one of the country that are making the most profit out of Bitcoin uh, in 2021. You don't ask me why, uh, but they are... Uh, one of the top country when it comes to, you know, like crypto, it's just crazy. Yeah. Yes, uh, I'm Vietnamese, so I know that. Um, uh, Richard, would you like to add anything? Or, uh, yeah. Yes, certainly. I mean, it really is just layering on what, what everyone else has already said. I mean, when you've got over 2 billion people across the world who are unbanked and who aren't given access to any financial services, I think it's, I just can't believe that we have a world where 
you've got over 2 billion people who can't get access to any financial um, systems. And then you've got 12 men who own 50% of the world's wealth. So clearly the systems that we have right now are broken. Um, you know, we've got a planet that's screaming for us to, to, to make changes. And I really feel that blockchain, along with some other emerging technologies, has have the capacity, if we use it and build it right, to be able to allow more people access to more opportunities um, to remove a lot of those gates and those barriers so that we can create a fairer society. And that's really what drives me the most. Anyone want to add any point of views? Yeah, well, let me just like one personal story. Uh, like every, everything which has been said here is completely true. Uh, our personal side to it is uh, we work with EY as a legal partner, and we worked hard on setting up a convertible bond pipeline, which like because our seed investors are all people from the crypto community, and we were looking at normal VCs to grow further. But together with EY, we built a, a cryptocurrency pipeline that through convertible bonds, cryptocurrency people could invest directly in our company without even leaving the crypto ecosystem. And we pay people in cryptocurrency as well. So uh, if you want to see the power of blockchain at work on that side, on the financial side, like we're halfway there to leaving the whole like fiat system behind, which is, well, I think a pretty big step, I guess. Can I add something to that? Yeah, sure. Please. Yeah, great, great comments so far. Uh, super nice to, to be here again. Um, I'd like to say that it's as beautiful as it is to democratize. Uh, I think, um, Jillian, your Ds were perfect. Uh, democratize, decentralize and all that. We need to understand that uh, we have to find a balance to bring this to the public sector as well as the private sector. We need to, we definitely need to collaborate with the government. And the other thing is um, that blockchain still needs a lot of work in terms of interoperability, scalability. There is a lot of challenges that we need to tackle around blockchain business models to be able to actually take this to the scale. And that's all. I agree. That's, uh, that's right. Because I also know that a lot of people still doubt about the benefits of blockchain in our daily life. Because uh, in general, we still uh, have a, a centralized system that uh, we depend on. So it's going to be uh, a lot of work to do. And it's a long way as well to rule its benefit in the future. I have a question to ask uh, Evelyn and Sven first. I know that you have a several projects to bring things from the real world to the metaverse. So could you please share with us what are the benefits of that? And especially, for example, Evelyn, could you please share with us your project? And what is the benefits of um, bringing fashion into the metaverse? Yeah, definitely. So um, fashion is all about stories and storytelling, narratives. I mean, the luxury brands, they are selling uh, dreams, right? They're not necessarily advertising that particular leather bag because of the leather bag, but it's about the, what the brand stands for. So um, working around sustainable fashion, I just found um, obviously tech tools and the metaverse as a great tool to tackle climate change, but also um, give these smaller sustainability focused brands that have limited budgets the opportunity to really innovate and be creative without the limitations of uh, financial limitations or physical world limitations. So these brands don't necessarily have the uh, budget to rent the Louvre or, or the Vatican City, but certainly in the metaverse, they can build the environments and the narratives that they want to. Um, <clears throat> another thing is, of course, um, supply chain. So a lot of people are talking about um, avoiding waste creation or replacing the sampling step of the supply chain with 3D modeling, but actually goes way beyond that. And uh, as you know, supply chain is very interconnected and every step of the supply chain has an impact to another step. So I think that, um, yeah, we can use these tools to make the real life fashion industry more sustainable. And uh, once blockchain companies find, or once this entire industry, the Web3 opportunities, which is in a very beginning stage, 
right now come together and, and find sort of the, the common rhythm or, you know, ways to work together to be able to actually push things like interoperability or um, help the non-technical people, uh, the masses, understand blockchain and, and NFTs and actually scale these, uh, not financially necessarily, but um, from accessibility and inclusivity perspectives to, to the masses. So there is really a lot of um, benefits and challenges at the same time. Could you please share with us your project? How does it work? Uh, especially um, your NCQ Person Week, TM, right? It brings passion into uh, the metaverse and uh, yeah. was a source yes. of the fashion world. Yes, it was the first 3D Fashion Week. Um, I just wanted to replace, I mean, Helsinki Fashion Week uh, is recognized as the world's most sustainable fashion week. Mm -hmm. In 2018, we built an eco village where we took everything into consideration from water consumption, sourcing, food, mobility, chemicals, really, you name it. Mm -hmm. And it was recognized by public and private sectors. And, and we went a bit further from there and wanted to really cut away um, from the physical event, uh, unnecessary elements uh, that we felt that could be dropped out. So we wanted to essentially drop out the showroom um, element and we started building, I started thinking about 3D interactive room. And that's when I stepped into the 3D uh, rabbit hole. And so Helsinki Fashion Week's 3D Fashion Week was hosted on Digital Village. It gained, um, brought in seven, over 700,000 people. Um, and it actually cut compared to the Eco Village concept where one visitor's uh, uh, emissions were th about 300 CO2. Um, it went uh, to 0.06 kilogram CO2. So, uh, and obviously in the physical event, we hosted about 10,000 people and in the digital one, uh, over half a million. So uh, we did a lot of calculations around how these tech tools can be used to, to tackle, you know, challenges around sustainability. Um, and so then I found a digital village, which is now a real time uh, MMO, uh, a very, very much focused on, you know, uh, giving the user an agency yeah, in game economy and lifestyle accessibility. Um, and of course, you know, um, we have a, just like uh, with with Fashion Week, um, we have very sort of um, disruptive uh, visions, uh, what we can do and how we should maybe build the metaverse spaces. Um, but again, we'll see when actually these metaverses open. So we are launching Q1. And excited to see the feedback from the from the members. You want to uh, restart it because I know that it's, it's stopped now, right? Uh, sorry. The the uh, Helsinki Fashion Week TM is is stopped now, right? Helsinki Fashion Week is not stopped. It's once a year. Um, I have a team running it, and I'm full time ah. focused on the Digital Village founder now. Um, yeah. Yeah, but I thought that the, the digital version stopped. No. It's still running? It was a one-time thing, the digital uh, event. Okay. With, with Fashion Week. Yeah, it was 2020. Uh, although uh, we have a lot of other fashion weeks uh, doing digital fashion weeks in Digital Village next year. So uh, I do think that uh, digital um, and physical uh, can coexist and, you know, find a hybrid model for fashion weeks. Yeah, I get it now. Thank you. Uh, Sven, could you... Please add any point from uh, your own experience. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, first of all, Evelyn, uh, I'm probably going to uh, check Digital Village right after this talk because uh, you made me kind of interested. So let me start with a bold statement. Like in Triple ZR's opinion, what Mark Zuckerberg showed is really not the metaverse. Like to us, it looked like a combination of technologies that would, would allow them to make a lot of money in the coming two decades. It's what they do as in their established advertisement and data monetization models, as well as bringing in some new hardware businesses as well. But if you've listened to Steve Jobs, you know that that kind of approach is just dead wrong. Like building a solution and then going out into the market to look for the problem, it's just not how it works. So like, like even if you're the biggest tech giant, so to us, the metaverse, the spatial web, it's the unification of the physical and digital market. So, um, 
with that digital market having as much access to technology than the fully digital ones, the metaverse is important because it will provide us with another chance to get back the freedom that we individuals as well as businesses had in the first round of the, the internet, where it was still all uh, browsers and, and websites like data ownership, freedom of expression in a digital way is, is just as important as, as, as freedom in real life. So for the last 15 years, we've gradually moved to what you can more or less call tyranny, like where uh, they're the only places where you can reach a big enough audience that matters are places which are governed where you don't control when you your message is spread or or how or to to who so like what meta roblox and 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 fortnite and some others do those are huge mini verses with their own rules where the metaverse metaverse shouldn't have any rules it should be open interoperable and people should be should have the choice to do whatever they want and to leave or to come back whenever they want and that is what is what Tropos AR is building so we're building an augmented reality network it's basically a, a small piece of technology which you can add to any mobile app which opens a camera and looks out to an AR cloud which is fully open and interoperable so anybody can put content in and anybody can can look at it and especially all the the data gathering to us, if owners of data which is generated, spatial data being a lot more valuable than, than old web data, it's the the person who added the piece of content. He should be should have a part ownership in it, and the person who looked at the at the content should have a part of ownership in it. So that's our business model. Like we do take some fees for making it all work, but to us, the principal owners are the creator as well as the consumer. Not like in the in the current world, it's this big overlord third party who sucks up everything and makes all the money, and, uh, and that's like that's not really the business model we think uh, is, is sustainable for the future. When you think about the fact that, as I understand it, if you put an Oculus headset on in twenty minutes use, you'll create twenty million data points, then it's really really important. If we think that we're producing huge data footprints right now. You know, that is just going to increase itself um, hugely when, when we're going into um, AR and VR. And so I think it's an, a, a crucial point that the data is protected, that we have privacy, that we have control. Uh, and as Sven said, that it doesn't just go to uh, one or two players in the market. Oh, yeah, that's, well, basically half what Tropos AR does. We build one piece of technology and the other half of all our energy goes to educating the people that... The choice is there and we're going to be able to make it over the next three to five years. But if we all pick convenience again, and like, let's, let's all agree, the videos what Zuckerberg showed you were, they were very cool to look at. But if we all pick convenience again, we might be in another tyranny for the next 15 years. Just to add to that, it's such a such a interesting topic. Uh, I think it really comes down to accessibility and seamless uh, use of technology. I think all of us as startup founders, including uh, I mean also Mark Zuckerberg, we face the the aspect of how do we actually uh, implement these technologies in our everyday lives that it feels good and if mark managed manages to do that first people will go there it's just how people work yeah. so we need to really work together to be able to make blockchains interoperable make metaverses interoperable and these are ultimately all just tech challenges because we all have the vision but um uh you need to uh organize an event where we talk just about tech which can be super interesting Chris, would you like to add anything? Completely agree with Sven. Uh, uh, put it out there as well because currently uh, I'm advising a project which originally they are a, um, a more like investment platform, mm -hmm. but they try to create a uh, simulated, you know, like metaverse where you know, like the even the investor, the user, they can create their own virtual version and they can interact with each other on that whatever it seems like you know like a game but it's it's not it's not just that right they they creating um academy function on there uh where people actually can create content can learn can share 
uh, and everything. And it, it has to do something with the investment as well as the interaction between all of the uh, key stakeholders, right? But like Bridget mentioned, right? They, they, you have to put a lot of effort out there to actually to streamline all of that into the real experience. Otherwise, it's just another way to do, uh, you know, like a traditional business differently, uh, whatever metaverse, right? Um, so I think it's it's uh, it's the early games for everyone, but it it really comes down to the uh, user experience and how you can onboarding a lot of these traditional even non tech uh, user into you know, whatever your definition of metaverse, right? I think it's, 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 there's still a very big gap uh, uh, on that. So talk whatever you want, right? Uh, these metaverse project out there, but we have a, a lot of uh, difficult job to, to do actually. Yeah, it, it depends on what are you uh, working on, you will have a different point of view on this. That's totally understandable. Uh, Julian and Abby, would you like to add anything? Yeah, this is a fascinating conversation. I'm, I'm loving all the different comments and different pieces that I'm learning. I love when Sven says, if we take convenience, we'll end up with tyranny. What a, what a true thing. And it's funny, if you think back to before Facebook came, like I joined in 2009, I think, around when we were on the start of it. Who would have thought we would have lived so much online? You know, and that's just, you know, your web 2.0, but it's just, it's a fascinating place. And then also, with Evelyn, I, my first blockchain event that I went to was fashion on the blockchain in Kiev. Now, I flew in, so my carbon footprint was pretty high. And um, I would have liked to go on to your virtual one because I have to say there were so many beautiful supermodels there floating around the place. I felt very intimidated. Maybe my avatar would, would have looked better or whatever. But um, I, I think there's so many different, you're saying, you were saying, Thai, that there's so many different applications and, and what would it become? And I know one of the projects I'm working on is with uh, Santa Casa. It's a museum in Portugal. It's also the largest charitable organization. So it's an interesting mix. It's a 500-year-old institution. There actually, there's a Santa Casa in Macau as well. I think I visited when, when we were there. But anyway, this one in Portugal, it, it, it it links the historic past and they've got more relics religious relics and body parts of saints in 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 um, uh, what do they call it again reliquaries i think i'm getting the word right whatever but this is fascinating plus ancient art and it's all religious based of course um, and then they work with refugees and with young people and homelessness so that they span this thing anyway what they're doing is they're creating first of all nfts of all these ancient items and it'll also have the new ones but they're creating a metaverse a step two and that's the whole that's the whole idea of how do museums remain relevant because we discovered in lockdown a lot of museums you know did some audio stuff which is exciting but the next step is to be able to go and visit it and have a look around and then if you want to buy your nfts as you would in the the gift shop on the way out you can and you're supporting good causes in this particular case so i think this uh, and i think chris you said whatever your metaphor verse is there's going to be so many of them i mean i was in decentraland a couple of weekends ago for a music festival and people names that i knew and people that i knew and I was a bit clunky because my laptop, I need to upgrade my laptop. But I, said, I recognized people in the audience. That was a weird, weird and amazing and wonderful thing to happen. That's true. And can, I, uh, can, I add, can I add one more point about the fashions? Uh, because I, because uh, Evelyn, uh, actually, I did something around that uh, space uh, for our Malaysian uh, KL Fashion Week uh, as well. So we did develop a, um, a traceability uh, application based on blockchain and that week, the focus was on sustainable fashion. So basically, they're making a lot of clothing uh, come from all kinds of material, like, you know, like a, a usage or, you know, like a car tie and then uh, use a belt and, and, and so on and so on. So each of the items and the material carry its own, um, you know, story and even the people who are actually making it. Uh, and that's why these sustainable uh, fashion uh, items are uh, selling for uh, so expensive because they try to bring back that value and then supporting uh, whoever are making it, right? And I think that are some of the valuable um, content or data you should fit into the metaverse because now you you watching in front and you know like uh, on a Julian story, right? You 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 go into a virtual conference and then you see this dress, you see that dress, but what the story behind the item are so special and and you need to have these proper uh, tune. Um, to to tell the story and, and and blockchain is actually one of the perfect uh, uh, tune for that. Yep, just very quick. Yeah, yeah. that's so that's so smart. And uh, Eddie said the internet of value, and it just kind of gives us sustainability another chance to actually uh, stream that value into right places. Actually, which is super exciting. Just to what you said, Gillian, uh, about art. 
Uh, I recommend to check out the Serpentine Gallery uh, Art Meets the Metaverse book. It's a white paper. Um, a lot of people contributed to, to it, including myself. It uh, looks into uh, the white cube uh, model and the metaverse model for the arts industry. It's one of a kind publication, super easy to read, 100 pages or so. It's amazing. I think you'd like it. Thank you very much for very insightful answers from all of you. And um, we have heard uh, some about the roles of blockchain in the metaverse, but now the official question to all of you, uh, what do you think about the roles of NFTs uh, and uh, cryptocurrencies in particular and the blockchain technologies in general in the metaverse? And also the um, return impacts of the metaverse on blockchain technology. Sven, would you like to start first? Yeah, okay. So uh, blockchains are just a lot better way to track data but with nfts like we're looking at a whole new way of how the internet works like right now the dominant business model was advertisement the actual content is free as long as we can make you look at as much advertisement as you can but with an nft you go like you could compare the old model the model we have now to the commercial tv like a cool tv but with a lot of uh, advertisement in between on the TV side, we've moved to Netflix and then Disney Plus and all that, just having a paid model and no more advertisement. With NFTs, we can do the same with any digital content, meaning that, especially with augmented reality, where you can place content within the real world and it's 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 uh, it's it's not you cannot just copy a 3D shape within the real world which is alive and moving. You can take a video of it, but you cannot copy it. So adding value to that through nft technology would allow you to create a whole new version of the internet where you don't have to have constant advertisement in between so um and that's a very big thing because like the, the value economy is it's it's it won't just be it's impossible without nft technology so and we have a one one clear uh, example which we want to talk about first here because it's 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 brand new and it, it shows you how nfts also interconnect the digital and the physical world so um our our goal as a media channel is to be a lot cheaper for businesses so that they have more room for other stuff and that will allow them to uh, spend some of that money in a different way. So we are now working with, with a company called uh, the Blue Future Organization, and they do, uh, they do NFT-based uh, seaweed certificates. And if you know a thing about seaweed, uh, seaweed is the best possible way to take carbon out of the air. So how it works is they put out small lines with, with budding seaweed on it. It sucks up a bunch of seaweed and then they make it drop to the bottom. So they're actually building ships that will do that as, at sea because 71% of our planet is, is sea. And uh, it's a very easy thing to do and it's a very sustainable thing to do. What we do is we will provide a content network that has some costs, but it's a lot cheaper than what you're used to at Facebook or Google. But within our cost, we offer you NFTs of those seaweed uh, um, seaweed certificates so whatever you do as content is not only carbon neutral but will be carbon negative meaning that you as a company the more you communicate the more you suck uh, carbon out of the air you as a consumer the more you consume the more you suck carbon out of the air that is a very good example of how nft technology can be linked to a physical thing can be linked to ecology and can be linked to whatever you do digitally actually fixing the problem instead of making the problem worse. Yeah. Uh, Eddie, would you like to, will you agree with that? And would you like to add anything? No, sure, sure. Very, very interesting project that uh, Sven is talking about. So, of course, I agree with uh, what was said that uh, NFTs are really a, a better way to, uh, let's say, to create kind of a, an economic framework in a, in a metaverse. Um, on, on my part, I believe that uh, the metaverse is going to accelerate the tokenization of assets uh, on the blockchain. This is something I call the tokenization overlay, because tokenization, tokenizing assets on the blockchain is not just migrating an asset onto a new tech layer, which we have done in the past, like securitization, which was 
moving an asset to a centralized database and, and in a different legal dimension, the securities legal dimension. Um, tokenization opens a new world really where you can have a lot of asset backed tokens and they can be units of value in, in various financial models that you can program on the blockchain. You know, you can have assets, uh, assets are fractionalized, used as collateral uh, and so forth. So again, we go back to the trust minimized solution that you need blockchain to provide a structure to this um, uh, economic uh, framework. Uh, you can transact on the metaverse, you can incentivize the users, you can pay, of course, for virtual goods, which are themselves NFTs. Um, uh, Chris, Chris Dixon from A16Z just tweeted two days ago, he said, NFT is, is equal to a unit of ownership on the internet. And that's, I, I agree with that. I think that the trust and the security uh, that we need on the metaverse can only be brought uh, by uh, by uh, blockchain technology. Evelyn, would you like to add any point? Because I know that this is a village has a lot to do with blockchain and metaverse force fields. Yeah, I I just uh, the only thing I'm thinking about right now is how we um, promote these technologies. Um, there is a lot of um, platform that states that um, we don't have to change anything. We can just go nuts and consume. Uh, don't don't uh, buy less by digital fashion is um, to me it it starts with mindset and and even if uh, we have dysfunctional economical and social systems in our real life environments we still need to be very mindful of that change um oftentimes um i mean a very smart thing that i heard um recently was um that how can we go and explore mars when we haven't even explored all the oceans mm -hmm. and we just kind of go ahead of ourselves and we just kind of smash everything out of our way and just go and innovate but actually we need to understand how this change is going to happen and how the world looks like when everyone is a micro entrepreneur and don't get me wrong I definitely think that everyone will be a micro entrepreneur we will be independent we will be using blockchain it will happen governments will use blockchain whether it's for economical or geopolitical reasons they will eventually use cryptocurrencies um but how this happens how this transition happens i think it's really important and and even if mark zuckerberg is uh you know doing whatever he's doing uh i think that the consistent and sustainable platforms uh as um chris was saying that there is so many metaverses out there that's true but not all of them will actually open up not all of them will actually be consistent and be around and actually be implemented in the everyday lives of the the new generation um so ultimately i think that what mark did his impact is there and he did put um these metaverses that will be consistent on the map and if they manage to sort of um you know uh run through or or keep up or whatever you want to call it i think this will be a trillion dollar companies and then the question is how do you find the balance between or ownership and open source what are the right models of governance in these digital environments and how are we ultimately going to balance our physical lives and lifestyles with the digital space. So I'm, I'm just uh, thinking really long term. And to me, my goal is to, because as we all know, there is long list of examples of failed projects to take uh, these concepts to the masses, uh, but very little successful ones. Um, so how do we actually manage to get 1.5 million Gen Zers to download their crypto wallet and start consuming in a way that it actually shows drastic dropping uh, CO2 emissions, for example, how can we make that happen? Because what's happening right now in, in the, you know, uh, uh, COP26 and, and, and other, uh, other events out there, it's not looking good. <laughs> it's not looking good. Uh, climate change is definitely something that all of us in this, in this particular talk here, um, maybe we actually, we are very privileged and we often forget about that. Sure. And people who are not actually face first 
those challenges um, of climate change, the, what climate change will bring to them. But eventually it will catch up with us because our supply chains go through their, their homes and arrive to us. So I think that uh, long-term thinking, um, I mean, I already forgot the question. So <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Answer the next question I want to add to uh, all the speakers. So, Gillian, would you like to add anything? Um, I've forgotten the question too. <laughs> but uh, this is, I think it's because, uh, Emma, you're right, we're privileged, we're, we're at the forefront, there's so much happening, and it's it's a, mind, a mile a minute. I was just thinking, I think you were saying about practical uses for metaverse. I think there was a question. But I was just thinking, I was going to say that. Like with music, for example, you know the way if, if you go to, well, now the concerts are happening again, a lot of people, they're there and have their phone up and they're, they're not even watching the artists. They're so busy trying to do this and they're running around. But what if your ticket was an NFT, which gave you access? You didn't have to hold your phone up because they would send you real live streaming or uh, you know special edits because you're there as part of your ticket. And afterwards, you get lots of merch and stuff like that to your ticket because you're an NFT and because the band wants to engage with you. So it's it's much, I, I love it because I, I, I'm of a generation. When I went to a concert, I did not put my phone up. Now, I did do selfies. I took different things, whatever but I actually watched the artist so it's nice to be able to go back and, and, and bring that back so I think the question was <laughs> one of the physical interactions so that's my answer anyway sorry about that <laughs> Julian actually I, I I think it's not it's not a concept actually they are already doing it and I'm advising a, a project doing on that so they are NFT uh, online and virtual uh, concert uh, which allowing you to have uh, access into uh, the back room and you know have a live stream interaction with your uh, favorite singer and stuff like that. So yeah. you don't have to go anywhere and you just sit there and enjoy your concert from all the way uh, in Asia stuff like that. But 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 if, if you're actually in physically at the conference, I'm thinking yes the yes yes, yes too as well. It's, anyway, it's it's lovely merging. It's again clever thinking. How can we make this experience more immersive? You know, and, and connect artists with the fans rather than. The promoters and you know all the people selling the, the the merch as opposed to the band yeah jill if i'm if i may hop in here it's a what you just mentioned is a million dollar idea because i basically stopped going to concerts because there was so much light shining at me from from phones it's it's, it's becoming ridiculous and with nft technology like we have a platform like what you just described we can totally do that and that's well. There's some guys within within the audience from my team. They're probably taking notes already. If we have to fix anything, then let's fi let's fix the 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 physical concerts. The whole with the thing with with all the bigger big phones and they get bigger and bigger. So at one point we won't even be able to see the artist. So <laughs> you can truly fix that. So I like hmm, that's pretty high up on the list of stuff to do. So thank you oh, for good. that. We should talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, would you like to add anything? Yeah, so uh, in, in terms of how is blockchain relevant, um, I think it's hugely relevant. Um, we've got communities that people want to be able to engage with, as we've been discussing the, the, last, the last conversations about bands and the audiences. Um, you've got content creators, as we've mentioned, and then you've got a way that they can um, be rewarded for their activity and have a financial exchange. So the blockchain technology sits in each part of those. The communities could become, and I, and I think the future of communities is going to be through decentralized autonomous organizations, which relies on blockchain technology. The NFTs that we're talking about and the ownership and how the, uh, the creator of the content can interact and share with their communities and not just for the first time that they sell their piece of um, content, but every time that some that content changes hand to another ownership so they can have perpetual um, income coming in from that. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we use the DeFi, decentralized finance platforms to be able to make sure that um, we, we can have the financial systems around it. So it's hugely important. And one of the things that I hear often in conversations around um, cryptocurrencies and blockchain is radical responsibility. So you don't have a bank to look after your own money. You have radical responsibility to look after it yourself. And I really think that that's a huge point. And going back to what Evelyn was saying, you know, we, we have to be more conscious about uh, and more respons radically responsible about our consumerism um, and what we're doing. And as you hear from everyone on the panel, there are lots of ways that we can still interact, that we can um, make sure that our spending helps the planet instead of destroying the planet. Um, so I'm very excited, but unless we build the technologies 
for this, we're going to end up in the same situation when we thought the internet was going to democratize us, when we thought social media was going to democratize us. Um, and that's not where we are at all. So the technology it has its amazing potential, uh, and it, but it's seeing creators like you have on the piano the panel to actually build the business models uh, and build the solutions out that will make the radical changes we need. Hmm. Or would you like to add anything about the negative impact of uh, the metaverse when we bring everything from um, the real world into the metaverse? Oh, one thing maybe, sometimes I see, I see everybody creating NFTs um, and it's good in a, in, a, in a research phase so we all figure it out. But at one point, we're going to ask, have to ask ourselves our question, do we need an NFT for everything? Because an NFT also has a carbon footprint. Yeah, that's and true. if it doesn't need an NFT, or maybe we should look into NFTs, which are just like my coffee mug can get broken and then it's done. Maybe there's NFTs that, that would have a, uh, an expire, expiration date. Uh, we really need to be mindful. Although I do, like with the seaweed uh, initiative, I do think that at least a big part of it, if humanity, we've always solved problems by innovating our way out of it. So just scaling everything back, it's not really a realistic plan, I think. Louis Rosenberg recently wrote an article that he shared on Big Think that talked about the potential uh, dystopian future that we could have um, with, with the metaverse. Basically, he was saying that when it comes to social media that we have now, it can manipulate our reality by filtering through what we're allowed to see or what we're not allowed to see um, so that we can go along having content that continually reinforces our belief systems. Um, and we've seen that, you know, with Cambridge Analytica, how people are being fed information in a very personalized way that is also very difficult to audit because it doesn't stay around for very long. Nobody else is seeing it. It's not like the um, front page paper of a newspaper uh, that everyone gets to see the same thing. And now when we become much more, you know, augmented reality and we have the opportunity to have much more data in front of us as we're wandering around and interacting, if that data continues to amplify this divide in people's thinking and, and this um, belief of truth that really isn't um, around the truth, then I think that can be very dangerous in terms of what the negative impacts can be. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's that. Actually, what you just mentioned is the biggest thing we're trying to solve. Like we're trying to say, hey, you're a, a butcher. You put content into the AR cloud, into the metaverse. It's you who put it there. And it's the people, your consumers who see it. There's no third entity that tells you what you see and what you can see because those echo chambers if you look at society right now um like like facebook has done a lot of cool stuff as well and mark zuckerberg and I, probably the most people from his team like they're, they're all probably like very nice people but algorithms have really uh, did a number on the world and like we have to fix this and we cannot wait another cycle of technology to do this so uh, like Agreed. what you just mentioned creating that one-on-one -on -one experience again without uh, the the controlling algorithm who just goes for more consumerism which is always on the on your fears come out much easier than your than 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 than, than the love side so it, it like all those algorithms even if they're neutral by design they will they will always bend towards you getting like like the the stuff you fear most and then that gets an echo chamber and then that's that spires totally out of control so yeah that's the 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 problem you you uh, mentioned is the biggest thing we're working on because we feel, we see it as a huge issue maybe just one thing i mean i i love this whole metaverse i think it has huge there's so many wonderful thoughts going on there what we can do and say but also it's very hard to replace interaction face to face with people and we, we don't want to be all in in the metaverse we want to get out sometimes go for a walk meet friends have a hug have a chat see people you know not just from here up you know i could be wearing anything i could be wearing a tutu skirt <laughs> i could be in my pajamas i could be in my activewear you know so it's just it's nice to actually meet people and it doesn't have to be all around the world but if you're your neighbor you go for your walk you whatever you see people so i think we need to remember we need to do that personal bit as well yeah that's right uh, a lot of uh... People are afraid that uh, when we bring everything from the real world into the metaverse, it will happen the case that uh, we will lose sight of the importance of the real world values. So that is something yeah, we really have to think about. Uh, which and, and, and I, I love hugs. 
Yeah. Oh, I love hugs. I'm, I'm voting for hugs. <laughs> I do love about. it as well. Everyone loves it. I guess so. Ben, would you like to add anything? No? Oh, yeah. Well, like I, if you describe the metaverse as some digital place, to us, the metaverse, um, like we do augmented reality geolocation based, so we can actually reward you when you go out and when you hug people because the gamification sites on our platform, I come from the video game world. I know most stuff we do digitally is just triggering a dopamine system. All your likes, all your views, all your comments on your, it's all the same thing and it's being overused. And we think that um, like uh, playing soccer for real with friends, it's much more fun than, than playing soccer FIFA uh, behind my PlayStation. But why is PlayStation so, so uh, damn addictive? It's because they've layered it with so much gamification, just like Fortnite and just like all the other like Roblox, you name it. We bring a small layer of gamification to the real world to get people out the door into concerts, into restaurants, into museums, uh, hugging people. Because if we stop doing that, then you end up at the dystopian future that some of us describe. I think Sven just saved the world. Uh, and I just hugging. My hugging guys are going to quote that. Everyone just needs a hug in the end of the day, don't we? We don't need anything and, else. We just need a hug. A hug and seaweed. Yeah. Eddie, would you like to add anything? My only negative on the on the metaverse and and blockchain, let's say together, is the the digital divide, basically. So by by the, the further we go into digital technology. Uh, the more we take the risk to widen this digital divide between people who have access to the tools to get there. And of course, not only the tools, but a bit of education and funds. Because right now, on some blockchains like Ethereum, a basic NFT transaction is $30 to $300 easily. And not everyone can, can do that. Um, so I guess that's, that's the negative I see that the crypto is a little bit already siloed between uh, crypto traders trading with other crypto traders. And there is very difficult for newcomers. Um, it's quite a high barrier to, to entry at the moment. Very insightful answers. And I learned a lot from you. And I totally agree that um, it has a significant impacts in our life, uh, especially when we uh, work remotely, uh, Microsoft had just launched their uh, Microsoft Mess, um, concentrating on creating the uh, working place for people who want to work remotely in for that purpose. And I think I, I really appreciate, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic like this. Uh, but also we cannot deny the negative impacts of them uh, on the environment, for example, as all the speaker have just mentioned. Uh, now, one thing, one aspect uh, you probably uh, have just mentioned already, but I want to get back to that. We already uh, see that there is a clear uh, dominance from individuals like uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook or Microsoft or Elon Musk to blockchain and uh, the metaverse because they can affect the rise of cryptocurrency that they favor or make people know more about uh, the concept of the metaverse, for example. So um, the question here is, um, do you think that in the future, we will be less dependent on uh, banks, on governments, but we will be more affected by individuals and companies who have the ability to um, affect the game's outcome, like you know, Facebook or Microsoft, et cetera? Um, maybe Sven, would you like to start first? Yeah, well, the way we see it, we see a lot of those big players as the, the Blackberries or the Nokias of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, like uh, if, if, if anybody like uh, watching this hasn't read the, the book, The Spatial Web, you really should. And uh, check uh, organizations like IEEE.org. They're building a whole new infrastructure for this next version of the internet. And I truly believe that those big players right now a lot of them, the reason why they move first and they, they, they shout so loudly is because they know the metaverse and its openness and its interoperability, it's going to be really hard to beat. So in my, from my point of view, 
just like with any cycle of technology, a lot of those big companies are not going to be like that relevant within within the next 10 years. So uh, yeah, I, I don't really fear that we're going to be dominated by them another cycle. No, not if not if I can help it. Let's let's put it that way. You my, my, yeah, my very my very quick answer, because I'm I'm conscious of time. My very quick answer is I think that we'll be less reliant on central banks 100 percent But um, in terms of governments, um, hopefully that they'll adapt and use this technology to be able to um, uh, improve their distribution of assets to improve their communications with their constituents and, and, and the people who live in their in their countries as opposed to um, necessarily being overtaken by a different system. Julian, would you like to add anything for Sure, I was going to quote my advisor, says she. Tim Draper says often that he hopes his grandchildren will ask him, Granddad, what, what are borders? What, what were borders? And I think increasingly we, we live in a world where just because I happen to be born in Ireland, doesn't necessarily mean that my community is here. I mean, I'm very proud they are, don't get me wrong, but I might be, you know, in a writing community or something else. So I, I think I think the, the nation state might become less important. And that's not a bad thing. I mean, I'm very proud to be Irish, but nationality can do awful things as well. And it's, it's, it's can we be proud to be one thing and proud to be other things too as well. So and part of, and if we're part of, it's like education, we're part of international groups. It's very hard to hate other nationalities or other people if you're if you there are people in your group you know you're different yeah it's not just i don't live in a little village you know in the south of ireland and see nothing else so um yeah i i, I think they'll be breaking down of borders and a more global audience which a global community with uh, and decentralized community which i think is fascinating and, and i'd love to see i'd love to be alive in 100 years time and see what happens evelyn would you like to add I just, uh, I have consulted governments and I would just say that uh, they should really try to hire us here in this call <laughs> to make them, uh, help them a little bit to, to navigate this uh, innovation. Well, I, I, I certainly hope that um, we will be less reliant on, on banks and governments, but uh, I agree with Sven. I, I hope that we're not going to be replacing this reliance on a few individuals or corporations. So, uh, as it was mentioned, uh, I think by by Bridget earlier, the blockchain provides uh, a big chance to experiment new forms of value creation and, and new decentralized go governance models. For example, DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations. This is getting a lot of traction these days, especially with NFTs, where people are kind of um, you know, gathering into groups to buy NFTs they cannot afford uh, uh, to buy by themselves. Uh, so, uh, and then they govern these assets together. So I think I'm looking forward to this kind of um, organizational structures and, and, and governance models. And that means that hopefully we're going to be moving away from some too, you know, uh, too easily corrupted centralized uh, systems. Uh, I have a, a slightly uh, just a different opinion. Uh, I think the central bank are here to stay, right? All the banks are here to stay. And I, I, I don't know, but I, I just feel like they, they do everything they can to really slow down the crypto world, to really uh, stopping all of these projects, actually getting all the approval because then it's actually going to happen, right? We, a lot of them are going to replace it. Uh, the central banks and, and some of the services provided by the bank. Um, but uh, that's the best thing about decentralization, right? You can't just decide on your own. The revolution is going to start somewhere else and either you, you want to choose to be part of it or you to be the follower, right? Uh, but again, uh, slowly, these central banks um, try to buy time and, and try to learn uh, in the background a lot and and they, they try to push some of the local banks actually to um, explore and, and um, learning if there's any possibility that you can take on these you know, blockchain product or not. Uh, at least that's just my observation from the uh, Southeast Asia uh, region uh, kind of activities. Yeah. My quick, quick comment that I think that we're going to be less reliant on banks mm -hmm. and I'd like to see governments um, learn how to use blockchain to be able to govern better uh, is kind of my key takeaways from this. But I think uh, it's going to be a long way because, uh, for example, in Vietnam now, uh, cryptocurrencies are not accepted yet. 
and uh, everything seems like uh, it needs a lot of time for people to first accept it first. So then we will think about it. Uh, there's a long way to develop it. Um, another question um, I would like to ask people from uh, blockchain community. Um, Crypto metaverse project, especially play to earn blockchain based metaverse games have attracted a lot of investment recently. Have you had any blockchain metaverse project in your current portfolio or in your plans for futures? And why do you think the incorporation of blockchain, crypto and virtual reality, augmented reality into this industry can make these ventures more appealing to investors? than the traditional metaverse-like online games that has existed for years. I would like to ask this question to uh, Abby first. Yes, sure. So I, I, I mentioned earlier in the my introduction, so we have um, invested in a company doing a, a play-to-earn uh, model game called uh, Indoors, and the NFT collection is called Blockbots. Um, they are supposed to save the earth in the future from AI overlords. So, you know, interesting uh, concept. Um, so, uh, and we also developing our uh, an NFT marketplace on, on RSK, as I, as I was saying. Uh, I think the reason why uh, investors are going into, into this space, um, uh, it's because th there are new monetization mechanisms that didn't exist before, uh, mainly, of course, tokens, uh, social tokens, uh, governance tokens. Um, and these are elements that were not traditionally present in the, in the online games that have existed for years, right? So basically, Axie Infinity, which I'm sure you know, uh, Decentraland, Sandbox, Orori, or another one in Vietnam called Rex Red Fox Vault, Va Vault. They, they all have tokens and these tokens can represent, you know, various, uh, let's say, economic interest of some form, but they mainly represent opportunities for their teams, for investors, for users as well, uh, to, to share in the success of the platform. And um, even Axie Infinity now is famous because in the Philippines, they have hundreds of thousands of uh, users who are, uh, you know, even surviving from, from playing these games. So it has almost replaced kind of a UBI uh, mechanism. So, so it makes a huge difference to the attractiveness of, of, of these ventures. Recently, we, we invest in a, uh, also a game which quite focused on 3D and AR uh, development on their uh, gamification called uh, Wanaka Farm, uh, which is one of the, 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 the game uh, original uh, from Vietnam as well. Wow. And um, uh, recently, I, I, you know, especially in the last three months, uh, I have seen a numerous of uh, game five project try to launch and it's, it's just such a crazy uh year for uh, game five um globally uh, not just vietnam but i think recently vietnam uh somehow surprisingly uh, start making a name for themselves uh in making a uh, game five project uh I'm, I'm interested to see how these project can actually survive all the hype and survive and actually deliver uh, the real uh, game that we all talked about, yeah. The one thing I, I, at the DeFi conference, um, someone gave a talk and they raised the point about the Axie Infinity and how uh, people who lost their jobs and low incomes were playing and, and to earn income. Um, but someone pointed out, which is actually true, you stand back, that's almost like being in a factory in itself because you're, you're just trying to play to earn earn points. And it's if you have to do it every day for 10 hours a day, it doesn't sound like a really nice way to earn earn your living. So just to be aware of that. So yes, it's great that if you live in a country where there's no welfare state and obviously you need to feed your family and you'll do anything to feed your family and that's a given, but it's maybe not quite the, the nice and shining armor that has been portrayed. It's just think about it, I think. Now I would like to ask the question to Evelyn and Sven. Um, do you have any uh, project that you have worked on or are going to have going to do that you'd like to share with the audience? Digital Village, uh, of course, um, we're looking, we're hiring. We're hiring um, Unreal Engine developers, uh, Node.js developers, blockchain developers. Uh, so heavy hiring process going on, growing. We will be announcing our um pre-seed around soon which closed um we got some amazing active investors on board um 
and launching Q1, lots of uh, big client onboardings and really working on creating purposeful and meaningful um, digital interactions and experiences uh, mm -hmm. and connecting them with the real world environment. And we have soon our uh, land drop coming in as well. And uh, so, yeah, excited about all that. Ooh. If someone's actually uh, looking, if, if you're a blockchain developer or Unreal Engine developer uh, and you're very good, uh, you should reach out to us. Sure. I guess a lot of people want to reach out to you at this. And Sven, would you like to add about your projects? Oh, well, yeah, we only do one thing. We only build one SDK, which is a window into the R, into the AR. Uh, so, uh, but we do enter markets one one at a time. So, uh, Tropos AR was was chosen by the world's biggest sports tech accelerator, which is called Hype Sports Innovation, which houses an amazing amount of talented people from high up in the sporting world. So, right now we're discussion discussing uh, contract details with some of the biggest players within the sporting world to come in with AR fan engagements as well as uh, NFT solutions taking them away from browser and desktop onto onto mobile and adding gaming and gamification to them uh, for like a wide area of, uh, of fans and that should be deployed probably by the beginning of next year and some announcements will be made in the coming four to six weeks i guess so that would immediately put us all the way on the top of the sporting world because we see live sports a i uh i'm i agree with jillian we need to get out of the house or like it's not going to end well so uh and the sporting world is is a crossroads of a lot of different things. It's a crossroads of a lot of different advertisements. It helps local shops and businesses, like a lot of stadiums. The whole economy around it uh, thrives on them. It, it brings people together uh, to compete, but also to to respect one another. So it it brings out the best of us. Ever since the Olympic Games, I guess, and then we're working with the EBU, which. Uh, is the uh, European Broadcasting Union who owns the the, the broadcasting rights of the Olympic Games? Um, but yeah, that's our that's our first market. There's a, a second one which is beer because hey, I'm from Belgium and we make quite a good quite a, a few good beers. Um, and then there's a few different markets coming uh, coming behind that. But uh, to us, we're the discovery layer, but we do help the like the experience is built on top of us. We do help them out. And then uh, live sports is definitely going to be the first one that gets a big wave of AR powered uh, fan engagement. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think sport, event planning, fashion, property are probably uh, the fields that will be affected the most by the metaverse. And even since that we are watching a sport and then uh, when we see the goal and then uh, there are messages in front of us, like sure, we, uh, it will with us, and it's gonna be very uh, exciting. And uh, I would say it would enhance user experience very much. Oh, yeah. 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 Let me give you one example we're working on. Um, basketball has, has, has four quarters, so there's a big halftime in the middle. Uh, with our technology, you as a fan, instead of being on Facebook or on Instagram during halftime, you will have this one big rim in the floating in the middle, and you, as well as everybody else who uses our technology, which is placed in the in in the app of the of the basketball club, will be able to shoot hoops all together until the last guy misses, and that guy is then the winner. Like we can do, uh, we can do fan engagements. It's really like putting video game content anywhere in the world and making it fit. So the 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 we truly see augmented reality as the new medium which up until this point everything we did digitally was done on one square meter like my phone my my computer screen my tv and my tablet maybe if i have a very big tv i'm i'm two square meter but we're bringing that from those one square meter or two square meter to every cubic meter of the world and that's a really big step and you can do you can do stuff in a stadium. You can do AR stuff as big as a, as a Boeing 747, and that's really unseen. That's, that's true. Uh, Chris, would you like to add any point from your project? Actually, you know, like uh, the idea, uh, the concept behind Farm Central is that uh, I think for a very long time, 
uh, movies or music video uh, has, has been a good investment product for a lot of the people. But number one, it's not accessible uh, for everyone. So even if you have a lot of fans, they actually uh, couldn't join, you know, like to tip in, for example, you know, like a couple hundred dollars or a thousand to help you to make the movies, right? And the, it's also the other way around. Uh, you are a successful or celebrity or a film uh, producer, but there are no better way for you to actually onboarding your loyalty f- uh, fans uh, into your product better until the tokens are, you know, like uh, being created. So now they have these uh, tokenization to actually allowing the fans to become the fan investor. So they can, number one, invest in the movies. They can actually own uh, these, uh, you know, like NFT ownership of, you know, like, for example, a mirror uh, of uh, some physical gift uh, from their favorite, you know, singer or celebrity or something like that. Mm. And they can keep it until, you know, like the NFT increase in price or, uh, or anything. And we are making all of that uh, available to uh, international uh, inter- invest uh, entertainment projects. So mm. it also meaning that you can stay in Vietnam and invest in a movie uh, in Korea, for example. If any, any of you actually are watching the Squid Game uh, series on, on uh, Netflix, right? It has been viral from all over the place. So I think in uh, December, uh, we are uh, come very close to that. So I think we're going to announce the first Korean uh, series go through uh, Farm Central platform uh, in December. And then in January, probably the first our uh, KOL uh, social token issuing for Korean market. Uh, and then we all, we're doing that all the way from here from uh, Vietnam. Uh, and I think that's one of the biggest value uh, where uh, blockchain and decentralization coming in. Yeah. That's cool. Actually, I haven't watched uh, Squid Game yet, but I heard a lot of, uh, about that. So um, the next- Can I just jump in quickly there? Can I just very quickly, with the Squid Games, I watched it, addictive. Episode four, I think it was, bawled my eyes out. Very clever writing, very yeah. good acting. But you heard, of course, that the Squid Game token was a total um, scam. I mean, you have to be quite careful because when, when was it was launched the week before last, from zero to up to 4,000. You couldn't withdraw the, the money they had. They called it an anti-pump and dump scheme. And then the anonymous owners took off 2 million there. That's yeah. just last week. Then we so careful. That's true. But that's the reason why I didn't dare to watch it because I didn't want me to be addicted to that. Uh, well, I mean, being, being, being addicted to the to the uh, to the TV series, is, there's no problem. It was very enjoyable and, and, and lovely. Just don't don't invest in any tokens that come out of it. Just just my personal reason. I'm a little bit busy right now, so I cannot be addicted to any series. <laughs> okay, so um, a question to uh, Gillian, especially Gillian and Bridges. Um, I know that you are enthusiastic at advocate for blockchain uh, and also for the ratification of women in blockchain. So uh, what brought you to blockchain and why do you think women should get into, get involved more in uh, this field? It's a no brainer really, isn't it? There's only was it, six or 7% women in the space. Um, I, I, my little joke is if the Lehman Brothers being the Lehman sisters, we mightn't have had the, the 2008 crash. <laughs> That's when you have, sorry. <laughs> I've said that so often, I don't even stop for the punchline. But it, it's like Bridget said, what, 12 men own like all, all the wealth in the world. That's ridiculous. We, we live in a world of 51% women, you know, 49 men, and diversity too as well. It's not just the gender title. That's an easy one to pick out, or is it in these days of uh, binary fluid, fluidity? But anyway, but it, it's too important. This is too important. It's, I believe in blockchain. We're all talking about amazing things it can do. It's disruptive. It's, it's disintermediary. It's inventive. It, it's rethinking. So for, to have a fresh thinking, we need women. I mean, that's why so many companies fail. We know it because it's all the same type, and you you... you generally gather with the same type it happens you have the stale male pale I'm very sorry you know on top of boards and those companies don't innovate so for technology that is such an amazing technology it's interesting it's fascinating um, i think it's very important that we have the other half of the population involved and i also think well, i advocate a lot this as on a personal level I go around because I, I hit the crash and went through activism and bankruptcy and um, and I changed the law and I ran in the European parliamentary elections in 2014 so a lot of things happened to me which made me aware of the injustices in this world but I, I, the reason why I keep on going on and I, I take every opportunity I can, like today, thank you, is that I say, if people look at me, I'm a middle-aged, middle-class lady. If I'm not scared by crypto, you don't need to be scared by crypto. So it's, it's not only am I representing women um, in this space, I also like to represent age in this space because 
it's not just a young man's game. And I know we've got a variety of ages and, and genders on this panel, but a lot of the times when you go to, like when I went to Lisbon, I know it's all blockchain. There were just gangs of young men, young white men in particular, all over the place. And I'm going, whoo, it's not a good look, you know, um, unless you were looking for a, um, a boyfriend perhaps. But it's, it's, it's just, we need, we need women. It's, it's, not, it's kind of an obvious statement, but because crypto and Web3 more properly, as we should call it, because it has been tarnished initially, by the status quo, we need to work extra hard to say, no, guys, this is innovative, amazing, you know, empowering. It's it's just fantastic. So anyway, that's that's how I why I go on and on about it. Yeah. About you, Richard? Um so from yeah, so we've seen technology being built by a few for a few. We've seen banking systems being built by a few for a few. Um, and we can see that there is a need for this technology and a need for a, revo a revolution and disruption in the systems that we've got. But the technology alone won't be able to do that. If we just have this technology that has all of this potential being built by a few, it will only solve solutions for a few. Because how can you understand what it is to walk in someone else's shoes, what problems they have, the best way to solve those problems, if you don't have anyone in the mix who, who can talk to that? So cutting out half of the population across the globe um, clearly isn't, isn't a wise thing to do when you're just looking at it from an economic point of view. Um, secondly, women are, I mean, I've spoken and other people have spoken here about the potential that um, this technology has to include more people into um, raising up their financial economic um, standing. And across the world, we are in, in every country, we see a divide between the financial wealth as, of women as a whole and the financial wealth as men as a whole. So um, this technology has you know, if you're in South America, and we've heard from Chris as well, saying what's happening in South, East, uh, South Asia, is that this, this, this technology isn't a question of why, it's a question of when, you know, how quickly can we have it, because we recognise that we have um, a need for it. Um, so I think there's lots that can be done um, to improve um, the financial uh, income, the financial status quo of everyone, which includes women. Um, also, we have a definition really of what is a masculine gender and, and thought processes and what is a feminine. Um, and it's not about being a man or being a woman. Um, but this idea, and Evelyn um, mentioned it a few times, is what are we building? How are we building sustainability? If you give money uh, and education to women, there's an awful lot of research that shows that the entire community around where they are improves, the whole community improves. I think it was a research in Ghana, apologies if it wasn't, but um, normally um, women grow food crops and the men grow cash crops. When there was a glut in cash crops, the GDP went up um, and it was alcohol and tobacco that was being purchased when the male farmers had more income. And conversely, when the food crops went up and therefore the women had uh, more money to spend and the GDP went up, it went on food, education and clothing. So we need this balance of, of how people think and how we're building these models to have this radical responsibility, to, to have the opportunity to, as I say, use this technology, but build applications and businesses and organizations um, and, and solutions that are really that we need in the world. Uh, and if we are excluding women, or if we're not actively including women, because at the moment it is heavily and predominantly male, then then I then you know I don't think there's, that there's, there's that much hope to look forward to. I believe it to be that strong. So there's there's things that we can do. I know that there are a lot of startups, uh, and when you're when you're using building a startup, it's really difficult. Um, you've got so much to focus on as well. So then um, trying to look at diversity and inclusion does seem like a secondary need. If you've got a network of people who have the talent that you need to hire and they happen to be all from because it's your network of, of, of people, you know, from the same group set, it's just too easy to go, well, we need somebody, so let's go with this. Um, if you do manage to bring in a woman into your organization, then she might find that she's the only woman in that organization and that could be quite difficult. So one of the things that we can do is, one, I'm continuously having a call to action to bring more women into the space. Two, we're looking at doing a zero to CTO program to fill the shortage of, of blockchain developers that are in the marketplace. The fact that we happen to fill them with women is neither here nor there. We're, we're, we're providing that solution. And three, 
communities like the Bigger Pie and other um, women in communities, make sure as a startup that you're aware of them so that you can offer your female employees somewhere they can go, where they can have a community that they can talk about work, they can talk about the technicalities, they can talk about the learning experiences, because we're all still making this up as we go along. And they have that balance. Um, and, and having a startup where, you know, they've cared and considered that means that you'll hold on to that female employee. So the next time you bring on another woman, you know, you're not losing them. So those are some of my thoughts. I could go on for another hour, but I won't, obviously. <laughs> okay, uh, I appreciate your efforts um, on this because I'm a woman and I, uh, I'm interested in blockchain as well. But um, this is actually not my question, but from viewers who sent to me and I, they would like me to ask you, uh, especially uh, Julians and uh, Richards. But for, for myself, I think that uh, this should not be a question because if it's good and men can participate, why not women? Just that. It's just simple like that. And um, now uh, let's check what we will get from the audience. Do you know anything about decentralized account model? Um, is there any application of it in the next generation of internet and the metaverse? Anyone? Oh, yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, I uh, like uh, we saw this question come in, and uh, I, I I texted it to uh, uh, to uh, my blockchain guys, and apparently it, it has to do like what we try to build on the data side is is a, a whole new way to do data ownership, and I'm not the uh, I'm not deep into blockchain. I like I know how it works on a superficial level, but I was told by some of the most skilled people in in, in blockchain in our region. That it's part of it's part of the whole, and he's going he's going to give me another lecture on on how it all works because I, I know uh, zero knowledge proof is, is part of it, um, but it's uh, it's it's above my pay grade. But apparently I, I checked it. It's uh, it's 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 on the table at uh, at our our guys that uh, that that are that are into the technical details of blockchain. Another question is: Is blockchain good and fast enough? Now you. Would you like to, uh, to answer this, Chris? Uh, it depends. It depends on uh, what kind of things you want to build. Uh, uh, I think if you're talking about payment, uh, sorry, but I, I don't think there's any protocol that can uh, beat out uh, Visa or MasterCard uh, in terms of transaction per second yet. Uh, uh, but if you look at, you know, like uh, some other application, uh, absolutely blockchain can, can, uh, qualify for all of that and um, interestingly uh, I also see a new wave of you know like uh, uh, blockchain oracle uh, basically it's, it's working more with a, a big chunk of data uh, and, 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 and snapshot all of that so that the blockchain doesn't have to process every single data that you know like belong to the uh, traditional system mm -hmm. so uh, you will see more and more the, the high bridge between uh, blockchain toward the whatever traditional system you have uh, and, and it's already happening yeah I, I don't necessarily compare I mean I understand and uh, uh, Chris is right let's say technically obviously Visa can process a lot of transactions faster than most blockchains but of course there is a big difference is that when Visa processes a transaction it sends it to your bank account it doesn't send it to you directly so in that sense, I, I prefer, well, I mean, uh, unsurprisingly, but I prefer to use blockchain, <laughs> even if it's a little bit slower, because at least I get the funds in my wallet. I don't have to sometimes go through the usual banking barriers. Like yesterday, I was trying to book a flight and they didn't let me pay because obviously uh, I'm far from the person in the desk and they don't trust everything I tell them. <laughs> so it's quite interesting as a... You know, I think we all we are we have all lived through this kind of situation where we have to convince your bank that it's actually you trying to do a transaction, and uh, if you answer a question wrong, then you restart the whole process. So it can it can it's a, it can be an hour an hour long uh, process, right? Yeah. So I like I like um, uh, I I think and I hope that um, we 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 will get the blockchain that can go fast enough for everyone to use, hmm. and uh, yeah, there are many blockchains out there. Uh, and to answer the question, uh, I, uh, you have to look what you need to do with it. 
Uh, and based on that, then you can uh, choose the blockchain technology that is most suitable to, to your needs. Yeah. Hmm, that's true. But I remember there are uh, several cryptocurrency can make the transaction very fast, like Solana. It has like uh, about 50,000 transactions per second, as I remember. They claim, they claim. Uh, until you, until I see a, a proper applications that actually can do everything that it said, then uh, so far it's a, a lot of the protocol actually claiming that, yeah. Okay, we we'll see in the future, maybe uh, there will be a way to reduce the process and speed of that. So the third, que the third question is, um, how to store data in the metaverse efficiently? Anyone could answer this? Technically, it's not as straightforward as people may think. I mean, you right now in the NFT world, uh, the data <clears throat> is eventually on a on a decentralized server like IPFS, for example, uh, and uh, that raises a lot of question. And I think Sven raised some of them uh, about it's supposed to be kind of a perpetual data storage. Is that, is that uh, reasonable or, or, or should we find another solution for that? But obviously for the metaverse, this brings more questions. Uh, Evelyn mentioned uh, interoperability before, and I, I agree. You know, when you move from a, a pure blockchain system to a more versatile or, or, or diverse system like metaverse, you will need, you will need standards, you will need... Um, you, you will need to make sure that the, the different systems can talk to each other. And obviously this is the beginning, I think, of blockchain and metaverse. So we, we're not there yet, yeah. Yeah, okay. Nice. Oh yeah, and I'm guessing the most content, if you talk about NFTs, those can be on, on, on blockchains and then decentralized, but most metaverse contents will just be stuff on servers. And I'm then looking at uh, Amazon Web Services which most banks run Amazon Web Services. Basically, the whole world runs on Amazon Web Services. So uh, uh, digital content needs to be stored in each, uh, in each region to, to, to access this fast, fast enough. And that's, like, that's going to be... It's centralized for now, and it's going to be a big challenge if you ever want to make it decentralized. Now, then I must say the Amazon guys have done a very good job of being fair and to not push a business model in between their dominance in this space that they have now acquired. So, so far, so good. If, if they do, if they do well and like they're, they're really fair in this, then it needs to be said as well. And uh, now is the end of the webinar. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's a fantastic webinar that I have uh, ever hosted. Um, during the time I manage TechSpeed, Today, I learned a lot from you, and I hope that in the future, we will have many more chances to host you at another event uh, organized by TechSpeed. And I hope that um, we will have many more chances to work with um, each other for as a project as well. So thank you so much for joining me and see you very soon in the future. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody.